thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much, everyone, for putting together this conference. I want to start by giving a huge round of applause to Tejas. He's like the absolute best, right? And we have him clap for him. <laughs> the absolute best. And I also want to say a huge thank you to Kent as well. How many of you have actually learned anything from one of uh, Kent's courses? I want to see all the hands. It's probably three quarters of the room. So my experience learning from Kent was actually learning AngularJS from him. Uh, while I was, I think, one of the first few courses that were published on egghead.io. Uh, I'm originally coming from Romania, um, and back in 2012, I guess, or 11, when Ken published those courses, uh, that was one of the first platforms that was publishing content for free, uh, and it was easy to get access to that education. And really, here I am today, speaking about Angular, uh, being a core contributor to the Angular project, and it's I'm just so grateful for everything that Kent has invested in this community and basically enabling a lot of us uh, to grow in our career. So thank you, Kent. That was awesome. All right, and I'm super, super excited to get to share with you some of the new things that uh, you might have heard about or you might have not heard about in terms of the awesome work that the Angular team has been doing recently and has uh, in the works right now. Uh, but let me start with a story. Uh, it's about the American Air Force back in the 1950s. Pilots were having trouble controlling their aircrafts, and incidents were on the rise. And they couldn't really understand why that was happening, what was going on. They looked at the skills, they looked at the tech, and nothing was coming up until they looked at the cockpit. And what was interesting about the cockpit was that it was created for the average person. But who is the average person? What they discovered is that in trying to fit the average person, it actually didn't fit anyone. And once they made that discovery, they redesigned the, the controls in the cockpit to be adjustable uh, so that they can meet the unique needs of their pilots. And that also laid the foundation of expanding the Air Force to women and building a more diverse and inclusive workforce. So you might be wondering, how does that apply to Angular, Simona? Um, as a lot of you might know, Angular is a very opinionated framework. And we know that that's one of our strengths. But we also know that each of you, like the pilots in the story, you have a different set of problems that you need to solve for, a different set of tools that you love using, and a different set of customers that you need to solve problems for. So just as the Air Force made those controls flexible, in the same way we're building into the framework the knob so that developers can use the framework in a way that it exactly fits their needs. So we want to meet developers where they are, and really reduce the friction of building great experiences on the web. And one of the first steps in that direction is really listening to what are the needs of developers. And to do that, we actually have an annual survey that we just closed uh, for 2022. Uh, but you can see here some of the results from 2021. Um, and for those of you that have filled in the Angular developer survey, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And for those of you that haven't, there's another opportunity next year. We run these on a yearly basis. And to our knowledge, this is one of the largest uh, developer surveys out there with over 20,000 people having uh, participated and provided their input. One thing that's like, we use the survey um, to feed into our team's roadmap, and uh, we really, really value the input. So thank you for that. Um, looking at the data, we see that a lot of you are happy with the productivity that Angular gives you. Uh, we also see that you're happy with how Angular helps you to keep up to date with the uh, latest releases, as well as the UI components and tooling that's available for your day-to-day productivity. Uh, but we also notice that there's opportunities for improvement, big ones. <laughs> and Benedict here is uh, uh, 
definitely recognizing some of that, and he will be talking more about uh, some of the work that we did there. But over the past few months, and probably over the past year, the Angular team collaborated with our absolutely wonderful friends here at Chrome DevTools to improve the debugging experience in DevTools. And we worked together to enable developers to debug and profile applications from the authoring perspective. When debugging applications using Chrome DevTools, we generally want to see the code that we've authored. And as you can see here, I am searching for my component, which is app component, but that's really the last result in the list of files that's uh, returned. And the first ones are either node modules dependencies or code that belongs really to the framework, which you shouldn't really care about, right? It's, you don't want to start debugging the framework. What you really intend to do is debug the code that you've authored. And in order to achieve this and make sure that we return the actual files that you've authored, uh, the DevTools team has introduced an extension to source maps that's called xGoogleIgnoreList. And this extension is used to identify third-party sources such as framework uh, code or bundler-generated code. And whenever a framework uses this extension, authors will now be able to automatically avoid code that hasn't been authored by them. Um, and I mentioned there, whenever a framework, generally, because we have enabled this for Angular, but any framework out there could actually uh, take use of this extension to source map. So um, any developer could benefit from this awesome work that Benedict and team have done. Um, we've just seen how that works for the open uh, file dialogs, but um, Chrome DevTools can automatically hide code identified as third party uh, in stack traces as well, uh, in the sources tree and, and in the quick open dialog that we've seen earlier. And it also improves stepping and resuming behavior in the debugging itself. Another area of uh, improvement for us was also making sure that uh, we create the context around asynchronous operations that um, you might have in your code. So you can see here that I have a 404 error, um, and usually you would get, because this is an asynchronous um, operation, you would get a lot of, uh, your stack trace would actually be um, many zone.js related errors, uh, and maybe just one of the call frames would be relevant for the co code that you've authored. But with the recent improvements now, you can see that a lot of that um, stack trace is actually related to the code that I've just written there. And the same is true for debugging. So while you're stepping through, we're now going to be able to avoid those third-party um, packages and the framework code as well. So you can see in the stack here that it's a lot more relevant. Another item of feedback was that sometimes, uh, that we heard was that sometimes errors are not very clear. Uh, so the team spent actually a significant amount of time understanding what are the common errors that cause confusion. And I did hear a few laughs there, so I'm taking that some of you are actually very familiar with this um, error message. This is probably one of the most uh, viewed um, content on our YouTube channel as well, because it's one of the most common errors that Angular developers will run into. And as part of that work of categorizing uh, the error messages and understanding more deeply what are the common ones that people run into, we created content like this video content in partnership with uh, Fireship.io. We also created a set of pages where you can read more about these, these errors, how you can um, solve them, and we're also linking them from the uh, stack trace directly in your, while you're debugging your application. Going back to the survey, we saw that debugging and profiling was an area of uh, improvement. Another area of improvement is testing, just the last one out there. And in Angular 12, we added support for um, three different end-to-end -end testing frameworks, the Cypress Nightwatch and WebDriver.io. Uh, um, and we also worked with the Playwright team to make sure that there's a migration guide where you can automatically um, add uh, support for your, uh, whether you wanted to work with Playwright. Um, it supports custom builders and schematics, which automatically update your project's configuration to integrate with your, directly with your Angular applications. And in version uh, 14, we also 
uh, based on community feedback via the RFC uh, process, request for comments, uh, we gathered feedback about what should we do with Protractor. Um, and what we've decided is to uh, basically um, my sunset protractor, uh, while also working with the community to find a long-term solution for active projects that continue to, or wish to continue to use it. We do understand that uh, it's not possible, or not all teams may be uh, ready to migrate away from Pro protractor, so we partnered with uh, the independent team at Hero Devs so they can uh, create a fork and offer long-term support. Uh, but currently, for new projects, whenever you uh, run NG end-to-end, -end, you're going to be uh, prompted with a choice to choose between Cypress Nightwatch or WebDriver.io. We also understand that end-to-end -end is probably uh, one, it's only one part of the story. Uh, Going into this year, we're focusing on investigating uh, what are some of the options uh, for unit testing and making sure that we are significantly improving the experience there as well. So please send us your feedback. Uh, we do run uh, per periodically requests for comments, um, so RFCs, uh, whenever we have new proposals. So keep an eye on our GitHub repository um, and of course the annual developer survey. Um, make sure to send us feedback there as well. Another area of improvement uh, or innovation uh, is around tooling. And we know that everyone is currently really, really excited about native tooling, and we see faster and faster build times for development, developer environments and production environments. And currently, the Angular Builder actually uses Webpack as a bundler. It uses ESBuild for code optimizations like function inlining, and then it uses Terser for even further code optimizations. And while this configuration is performant, uh, with the recent uh, evolution of tools like ESBuild and Vite, uh, we do think we can do better. Uh, so last year, we introduced experimental support uh, for ESBuild, and Basically, it compiles um, pure ESM output and includes support for watch mode for your developer workflow. Over the coming months, uh, we want to close the feature gap with what's currently possible with Webpack um, and make sure that we bring all of those capabilities into um, our ES build support as well, with the goal to make it the default pipeline and removing uh, support for Webpack as well as all the other parts of the pipeline and focusing on uh, ES build. And to give you an example of, uh, or to give you a uh, an example of what's the impact of that. Basically, if you look on your left-hand side, I've created a basic Hello World project uh, using the currently stable uh, pipeline. And you can see that uh, the build time there is about seven seconds. And then on your right-hand side, I've created a new project using uh, ES build. And the, uh, the build time is 3.6 seconds. So, this is consistent with our findings that with ES build, we have about 57% faster cold builds. Ooh. We're just as excited. <laughs> you can enable this today uh, in your project by editing the angular.json uh, file and replacing Angular browser with Angular browser ES build. But remember that this is still experimental, so you can definitely try it, but some things might not work, and not all of the options that are currently available for um, the uh, stable pipeline are available for ES build. Uh, do try it out uh, and give us feedback on uh, GitHub as well. So shifting gears a bit, another strong theme that we talk about is uh, simplification and reducing the learning curve uh, for Angular developers. And one way in which we're doing that is by trying to reduce the number of concepts that developers need to learn while they're early in their journey. And one of them is um, ng module. So as you can see here, to get started with an Angular application, there's a couple of things that are going on here. First of all, you have to create a component, then you have to create an ng module and uh, declare that component in your ng module, and then you have to bootstrap your application um, by bootstrapping the ng module. And this is a lot to take in, especially for new users or new web developers. 
Um, another potential area of confusion for developers might also be understanding the difference between ng modules and JavaScript modules, right? We, we even had to write a guide about it because we got this question quite a bit. And furthermore, the ng modules API surface can be quite complex and it actually has multiple responsibilities. It includes compile time configuration through the declarations uh, array as well as runtime configuration for dependency injections through the provider's array. Uh, it's also responsible for composability and grouping uh, through the imports and exports array that you can see there. We recognize that ng modules are a really great way um, to organize an application and it enables folks to develop patterns around how they separate concerns in their applications. But over time, and, and over time, many, many of these patterns have emerged and folks have become very productive in using them. Um, and they're great tools for more complex applications, but we really wanted to explore what a simplified experience would look like um, without ng modules. And that's when we spent quite a bit of time um, building what's known and what you might have heard about, uh, which is standalone components, directives, and pipes. So getting started with Angular uh, standalone components is as simple as writing your component and then directly bootstrapping the application um, using that component that you just wrote. Um, and you can see that this requires a lot less concepts that you have to dive right into uh, from the beginning. Um, and that's visible even from a code size perspective. On the left-hand side, we have the previous way of writing your Hello World application. And on the right-hand side, it's the standalone mode of uh, writing applications. One of the side effects of standalone um, is that components are now the smallest uh, unit of reuse, and you can directly lazy load your component, um, which actually simplifies use cases like, like the router. So we can see here that I'm now able to directly lazy load my component. Um, in the previous version where you would, we, you would use ng modules, you would have to first lazy load, lazy load your uh, ng module. Rewriting some of the router APIs to add support for standalone, it actually enabled us to shave off 11% of the uh, router bundle whenever we're not, you're not using some of, those, um, some of the functionality that you might not need. Uh, so that was awesome as well to see as a result of standalone. Lastly, very recently, for those of you that are excited about standalone components, um, we actually wrote a set of schematics, um, which are basically automation tooling that allows you to automatically migrate from your ng modules based applications to standalone based applications. And we are optimizing for correctness, which means that probably you're not going, we're not going to be able to 100% help you through that migration. You're going to have to do uh, some of that work manually, but we're definitely going to leave like, comments in the code and give you um, directions around what you need to still do in order to complete your standalone migration. But to be clear, the goal is not to remove ng modules, but rather to enable a getting started experience that doesn't require folks to learn about ng modules immediately. Um, and we made sure that standalone works very well with ng module based applications and that you can easily import ng modules into standalone uh, components, directives, and pipes, and the other way around. Um, so we're evolving Angular in a way that um, you can use both concepts at the same time uh, without having to do full migrations if that's not possible for you. Apart from simplifying the learning experience, standalone also allows us to ship features that weren't possible before, uh, like Directive co Composition API. This was one of the most requested features and highly voted features um, in our GitHub issues. Uh, the ability to basically reuse behavior from multiple directives on one directive. And you can see here that with the Directive Composition API, you can compose a behavior from one or multiple directives into a single one. So um, here the host directives um, property there tells Angular that whenever a menu with tooltip is created, the CDK tooltip and CDK menu directives will also be applied 
to it as well. In the past, you would have to do things like either use TypeScript makes sense or basically make sure that you never forget to apply these directives, which is very error prone. If you want to learn more about the Directive Composition API, um, we actually have an excellent video that was created by Jeremy uh, on the Angular YouTube channel. I highly recommend that you go check it out. But ultimately, as we're going through this journey of simplifying the developer experience, our goal is to really help you put the user at the center uh, while reducing friction for building those great experiences. And one way in which you can measure that user experience is through Core, core Web Vitals. I just want to see a, a, a show of hands. How many of you are familiar with Core Web Vitals and you pay attention to them? Awesome. That's probably half of the room, uh, which is great news. Uh, and for the, the other half of the room, uh, basically you can use Core Web Vitals to measure user experience from a different set of metrics that might evolve over time, but currently there's uh, one that focuses on loading, and that's the largest contentful pane. And you can see here what are the thresholds for what it means to have a good loading experience for your, for your user. So good experience means LCP that's below 2.5 seconds. Uh, another key metric that we focus on is interactivity. So first input delay measures that, and a good experience, in, good experience from an interactivity perspective is um, whenever you're below 100 milliseconds. That's the green there. Um, and finally, we also focus a lot on visual stability. That's the cumulative layout shift. Um, and ideally, you should have less than uh, 0 0.1. Um, so basically, not creating those types of experiences where um, as the user is opening up a website, things start to shift around. And over the past few years, we have worked with the uh, Chrome Aurora team to investigate and improve Core Web Vitals for Angular projects. And we tried to do that from a, a systematic approach where by improving how Angular is built, uh, we are basically increasing the chances that all of you actually build much better websites with a much better user experience. And one of our recent focuses has been uh, LCP, Largest Contentful Paint. And one of the discoveries was that uh, 71 to 79% of pages had an LCP element that was an image. Um, and furthermore, desktop devices had an even higher rate of uh, LCPs as images. So basically, that tells us that if we're going to um, help you all work better with images, then by default, your applications are going to score much better on these core web vitals. Um, and we wanted to make it easy for you to adopt best practices for loading images. In particular, um, apply intelligent lazy loading, uh, prioritizing critical images, um, make sure that we provide uh, optimized configuration for some of the popular image CDNs, and build in a set of errors and warnings that guide you through the process of incorporating images and incorporating these like, best practices in your application. So in your applications today, you can use the image directive by updating the image uh, source to ng-src. And this, out of the box, will start lazy loading all of your images. Um, as a next step, what you have to do, uh, if we go back to these like, best practices, you also need to make sure that the image that is your LCP is actually priorit is prioritized as part of loading. And one of the things that I've discovered that really make a huge difference in, on your LCP um, is also making sure that you use image CDNs like uh, Claudinary or ImageX or any other um, image CDN that allows you to serve your images in modern web formats and very fast. Um, I do have a demo. I don't know if I have enough time for that. Okay. So, let me just... Okay. 
Okay, let me do this here. I traveled here by train, so we're gonna see a lot of train pictures. And I built this really silly application that displays images in text. And you can see that I was very lazy. Like I didn't even bother optimizing any of these pictures, downloaded them from Unsplash and um, added them to my application. Which means that I have tons of resources here. Uh, so you can see that the images are still loading and I'm dow downloading probably tens of megabytes uh, for my application. And there's an opportunity to use the image directive and it's gonna be a bit hard with my extended display but let's see how that goes. Okay, so first thing that we said we have to do is actually use the NGSRC directive, right? And this, what this does is um, it really starts lazy loading our images. And in order to use the NG um, image optimized directive, I need to also import it in my application. And if I go back to my application, immediately we will see that we have a set of errors. <laughs> so it wasn't as easy. Uh, but what this error tells us is that I've, I'm trying to render an image without it having a width or height, um, and that's not great, because that will basically ruin my C, uh, CLS, my cumulative layout shift. So it's telling me that I should add uh, a width and height to my images, and I'm gonna add a random one. We have to do better and make sure that these are meaningful <coughs> ones, but for the purpose of the demo, we can do this. Um, and this is really what I was mentioning earlier, that the image directive gives you errors and warnings so that you can make sure that you're adopting best practices for your images and setting size for your images is one of the ones that's re really important. Um, so now we can see that if I go into my network, I no longer attempt to download all of the images, but actually only the first two, which are basically my first one, my um, LCP, and then the second one, which is just below uh, the viewport, so the browser will load that um, automatically. But I no longer, if the user never gets to the last image, we shouldn't load that, right? It's data that they don't really care about. Um, the other thing that, we can already see in the console that we're being told to do is that my images are hosted on an image CDN, uh, but the app is not really using the built-in loader for that CDN, which has a bunch of optimizations still that it does. Um, so let's look closely at the image here. I know the font is a bit small, but you can see that I'm requesting a JPEG image that has 4.3 megabytes, horrible, terrible. <laughs> so the next thing that we can do is add our provider as we're being inst instructed. And you can see here the list of a bunch of loaders. I'm gonna focus on the ImageX because that's the one that I've used in my application, and copy the URL. Very slow. 
Of course, it's a string. And then what I can do is actually start removing also the, the part of the URL here that has to do with the CDN because now I can immediately, like the image loader will, will know to use relative paths as well. But the key thing that I want you to see is that what the image loader will do is it will now attach to the URL um, query params like auto format and with 800, which means that instead of requesting JPEG images, I'm now gonna, the um, CDN will see whether the browser has support for more modern image formats, and it's gonna send me those image formats rather than the older ones like JPEG, uh, which is gonna take a lot less. So you can see here that the CDN has returned my image in AVIF, and now it's no longer 4.3 megabytes, it's 94 kilobytes. And actually, this is the one that I've, that already uses the image CDN, and this is the one that doesn't, that hasn't been prioritized. So you can see that the first one returns 3.1 megabytes, um, and the other one is a lot smaller. There's a couple more things that we need to do here, um, including making sure that our LCP image, which is the one that I added at the top, also uses NGSRC. to make sure that we're using the image directive. And we also need to mark it as priority, give it a width and the height, um, and that's going to really take us a long way from to optimizing our application and optimizing the images that we're returning in our application. And I'm gonna stop there um, to make sure that I'm, I don't run too late, but you can get a feel for what you need to do in order to um, optimize your application so that it has those awesome core web vitals. And here's a guide uh, that will tell you how to get started with uh, the image directive. So these are things that we've worked on, but there's a couple explorations and a couple things that, we're, that are top of mind for the team. Uh, we're constantly looking at how we can improve um, continue to improve our documentation, focusing on the initial learning journey, uh, on the usability of docs, and making sure that we have consistency across how we're presenting topics. Uh, we're also exploring improvements that we can make to server-side rendering, um, and you can see here that um, currently we're focusing on non-destructive hydration, um, adding standalone support in Universal, which is enabling server-side rendering in Angular, um, adding ESM support, and improving the dev server there. And finally, this is what uh, Tejas was really excited about. Uh, we're exploring reactivity and asking questions like, can we have per component change detection, zoneless Angular, and computed properties? Um, and if you're following some of the um, news around Angular, you you're already know that we've published a pre-RFC. Uh, we've begun prototyping work around adding signals as a reactive primitive in Angular, which is extremely exciting. The team is just over the moon. Um, and we've had, before landing this prototype, we've actually spent significant amount of time looking at what are, what are all of the alternatives um, and what, are, what, what gives us confidence around a set of principles that are really important to um, the work that we're doing. Uh, we believe that a adding built-in reactivity to Angular, it really unlocks new capabilities, including um, making sure that we have a clear, unified uh, model for how the data flows in our application. It also enables us to add uh, computed properties, so um, built-in framework support for declarative uh, state, derived state. Um, and it also allows us to move away from the global top-down change detection and um, do more uh, specific per-component change detection, which will give us some uh, performance improvements as well. Um, and for those 
those of you that are Angular developers, there's a couple other things that you're probably going to be very excited about. Um, we're significantly improving the integration with reactive libraries like RxJS. Uh, we're also making sure that we add better guardrails in place that allow you to no longer run into the infamous error expression changed after it has been checked. Um, and this is also a, a really good path towards writing zoneless applications and removing, eliminating some of those quirks that you all have been experiencing with uh, zone.js. And it helps us to simplify many, many uh, framework concepts that um, we were excited about, things like queries and lifecycle hooks. The Awesome Sarah Dresner has posted uh, an application that explains the core concept, so I highly recommend that you uh, check it out and continue to watch this space. The next step is for us to publish an RFC and continue to gather feedback um, on some of the core concepts and how this is going to impact the Angular ecosystem overall. We're really, really, really excited about what's ahead for Angular. Uh, but most importantly, we're exploring all of these topics with the priority of evolving Angular while also maintaining platform stability uh, and bringing everyone along. So that means that uh, however we're thinking about these features, we're making sure that they're interoperable with existing Angular applications. And also, we're prioritizing maintaining the properties of an opinionated framework that includes the knobs so that developers can use it in a way that exactly fits their needs. Thank you so much. <laughs>